We've looked at several systems quantum mechanically that include angular momentum, and I want to give a, a brief overview of what we've done and where we're headed next, and so you can get an idea of how these all fit together. We looked at the particle in a ring first, and that was a case of 2D rotation, that is, rotation that occurred in, entirely in a plane, say the xy plane, we had rotation of a single particle going around in that in a ring. We then looked at a rigid rotor, which uh, we can think of as three-dimensional rotation because we included both the angles theta and phi in our treatment, and that led us to the rigid rotor energy levels and the rigid rotor eigenfunctions, which we found out were the spherical harmonics. Uh, we're now going to go into a non-rigid rotor where we have rotation going on in three dimensions, but we also are allowing for some change in the radial coordinate. So it's useful to look at the Hamiltonians that correspond to these three cases. So for example, in the particle in a ring case, our Hamiltonian was simply minus h bar squared over 2 times i times the second derivative with respect to phi. Okay, it just had a single angular coordinate. And our i, we noted, was the moment of inertia, which was just the mass of the particle times its radius squared. When we went to the rigid rotor, our Hamiltonian now could be written uh, a little in a little bit more sophisticated fashion as 1 over 2i times the angular momentum squared. And now our moment of inertia was the reduced mass of those two particles in the rigid rotor times their radius squared. We're now going to uh, look at a more sophisticated Hamiltonian where we will have a part that is due to the radius, so the kinetic energy of the radius, plus our rotational part, that is the angular momentum squared divided by twice the moment of inertia, and we'll have a part that involves the potential interaction between two particles that uh, basically governs that radial change. So all of these are elements that we'll now see in the hydrogen atom when we begin to look at its uh, quantum mechanical development. So if we were to write down the hydrogen atom Schrodinger equation, and let me write out what it is I'm doing here. We'll end up with an equation that looks something like this. Okay, we'll have our Hamiltonian operator operating on a wave function that now depends on r, theta, and phi. And we'll end up with a minus h bar squared over 2m r squared d dr r squared d dr of our wave function. We'll also have a term that looks like this, 1 over 2 m r squared. And this is coming, by the way, from the expression of the Laplacian operator in spherical polar coordinates. And we noted that uh, this actually looks like the angular momentum squared now operating on this. And then we'll have a potential term. In the case of the hydrogen atom, that potential is the Coulomb potential, which we saw in the last video could be written like this. And then this is all equal to the energies of the hydrogen atom times its wave function. So this is the Schrodinger eigen, uh, time, independent, time independent Schrodinger equation, um, which uh, has energy eigenvalues E. Okay, so these. I want to be sure that uh, this is for the H atom energies. So ideally, uh, since the Bohr model came so uh, in such good agreement with the Rydberg formula, we want to get energy levels that probably look a lot like the ones we had from the Bohr model. Now we're going to invoke the separation of variables for this differential equation. And to do that, we're going to write our total wave function as the product of two parts product of a part that's just due to the radial changes and a part, and I'll just call it little f, that is a function of the angles. And I will also do some other simplifications. So for example, this term here that represents the kinetic energy of the radial part, I'm simply going to write as capital K with a little r to remind us that this is just the radial part, the kinetic energy of the radial part. Um, this is already simplified to the extent that I want. And uh, because this does, it's not difficult to write, but I have to write it over many times, I'm simply going to write this as V hat, which is the potential energy operator for the Coulomb potential. 
So what this means is that I can now write my Hamiltonian as the, sorry, the kinetic energy part due to, uh, due to the radial part plus 1 over 2 mr squared times l squared plus the potential energy part. Now I want to note that this kinetic energy part only affects the radius, so it's only going to impact the r of r part. The angular momentum operator is purely about the angles, theta and phi, so it will only operate on the f part. And the, cool, and the Coulomb operator, the potential energy operator, is just a multiplicative function, so it will operate equally well on both parts. So when I write out this Hamiltonian equation in the case of a product of these two wave functions, what I'll end up with is something that looks like this. So once again, I'm writing the Hamiltonian operating on the operator, but it's going to be equal to my angular part times the kinetic energy operator operating on the radial part plus the radial part over 2m r squared times the angular momentum operator squared operating on this f of theta and phi. And then my potential energy operator uh, doesn't have any, it just multiplies these two functions, so I'll just write it out like this. And this is just equal to E times the product of these two functions. All right, now there's a couple of things I want to do to manipulate this equation. And I'm sorry that this is all really about a bunch, doing a bunch of algebra, but I'm trying to keep the notation simple enough that you can follow it. What I want to do is I want to get rid of the R dependence of this term. This is the only term where we have significant activity going on with the two angles. So if I can separate that out somehow, I'll be able to separate this differential equation. Well, what that means is that I effectively need to multiply through by this uh, 2mr squared, so I can cancel it in this term. I'm also going to divide through by the product of these two functions. So when I do that, and I hope you can follow what I'm doing here, so I'm basically taking 2mr squared times my Hamiltonian operating on this operator, and then dividing by that wave function. So when I do all of that, okay, I'll divide out this f, and I'll, and I'll have a 1 over the r, so I'll have 2mr squared over the r times the kinetic energy operator operating on the R. For this term, I've gotten rid of all of that. I'll have 1 over the function of the angles times the operator, uh, L squared, operating on this function. And then I'll have 2m R squared times the uh, potential operator. And I'll have the same thing, minus E so I'll bring the e over to the left-hand side of the equation, so this is now equal to zero. All right, so what have I done here? I've got a piece here that depends only on r. I've got a piece here that depends only on theta and phi, and a piece here that depends only on r. So in effect, what I have done is to separate this differential equation. Okay, since these pieces depend only on r, if I start varying the r, it doesn't have any effect on this piece. So that means that the effect of varying the r there must be equal to a constant. Similarly, if I vary theta or phi, I'm going to change this middle term, but I'm not going to have any effect on these two terms. So in other words, that one must also be equal to a constant. Now since the constant that the first and third terms are equal to and the constant the middle term is equal to must add up to zero, I can use the same symbol and just change the sign. So what I'm going to do is actually uh, set this equal to uh, negative gamma and this equal to positive gamma. So for the angle dependent part, I'm going to have an equation that ultimately will look something like this. I'll have this divided by f is equal to negative gamma um, 
and then when I multiply both sides by f, I'll move this over to the other side. So I'll have f of theta and phi over here. And uh, what I'll find is that the value of my gamma here uh, must be equal to the eigenvalues of the angular momentum squared operator. I forgot to put the square there. Okay, this is just an eigenvalue equation for L squared. Well, we know already what that result is. We found it with the rigid rotor. We found that L squared operating on the spherical harmonics gave us h bar squared L times L plus 1 times the spherical harmonics. So this is that eigenvalue equation, which allows us to immediately identify this function f as a spherical harmonic and this value gamma as equal to this combination of constants, the eigenvalues of the angular momentum squared operator. So when we're done with all of this, um, we'll actually be able to um, include that into this term here and in fact ultimately into this term here so that when we rewrite the Hamiltonian we can focus on the radial dependent part and the angular part has already been solved. That's the main thing that I wanted to get across in this video. We'll go ahead and look at the radial equation, the radial part of this Schrodinger equation, in the next video.